In 2019, Disney and Apple launched their streaming services, officially starting the Streaming Wars, a title for the competition between the top streaming services to control the ever-growing market dominated by Netflix, Prime Video, and Hulu. Each year after that, we'd see new competitors join the war. HBO Max, Paramount Plus, and Peacock to name a few. But now, only a few years later, we are seeing that the transition into the streaming market wasn't such a great idea for many, with all but one streaming service reporting losses. Someone has to lose a war, and the financial results are making it clear who lost. But the real loser of this war is us, the consumer. The oversaturation of services, the splitting of catalogs, and the constant price hikes are just a few of the problems we've experienced. And with Netflix's latest password restrictions, we are now starting to see the worst of it all, as all streaming platforms are shifting their focus from market share to profit. So let's take a look at the past, present, and future to see how this war affects us. The term golden age will be tossed around a lot as we've experienced quite a few of them within a few years. The golden age of streaming was in the mid 2010s when Netflix had a few years of success making originals like House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, and Arrested Development. But on top of those, they had a vast catalog of shows and films from other studios. Sure, we had to deal with the price increase every couple of years, but it was okay as having Netflix by itself was enough. This period coincided with the final years of television's second golden age that started in 1999 with The Sopranos. It became very convenient being able to binge through some of the best shows of all time, whenever you wanted and without commercials. So convenient that Netflix and streaming overall were able to combat piracy during this time. Both these golden ages came to an end in 2019 with the introduction of the streaming wars. Your shows were no longer all in one place. New streaming services started coming out every year, and if there was a studio behind one, you can bet your money they'd make their content exclusive to their own, taking it off Netflix. With a market packed with competitors, exclusive content became the strategy for gaining subscribers. Like Bill Gates said in 1996, content is king. But this focus on exclusivity would only hurt the industry and especially the consumer. Rather than reducing its price after losing a lot of licensed material, Netflix went on to do the opposite. It became a shell of its former self for a higher cost. But why? Because now Netflix had to ramp up their exclusive content so that one, they could offset the licensed material they lost, and two, to compete in the oversaturated market where everyone is pumping out original material. What they once basically had a monopoly over was now becoming a battleground for who can produce the best and most original content. And this is where we had the golden age of the streaming wars. It didn't last long, but every streaming platform greenlit many shows, throwing everything they could at the wall to see what sticks. Disney Plus already had successful IPs with Marvel and Star Wars that could be turned into successful shows, but others like Netflix would have to work twice as hard to compete with a centuries worth of original material that these other studios built up over that time. With traditional or linear TV, experimentation was very limited due to there being a set number of channels and time slots available. Each channel also had its own audience with content tailored to them. But with streaming, diversity and originality rose to an all-time high in TV's history, with shows like Dark, BoJack Horseman, Invincible, and Squid Game. All of this content being available to anyone at any time meant that even more had to be created to target as many types of audiences as possible. And this level of competitiveness and sheer amount of content only escalated in the first couple years of COVID, when more people were staying at home and watching TV. Although this content was spread across multiple platforms where subscribing to more than a few wasn't practical, this was still considered the good times for us. It got much worse when the market became stagnant and they found out what content sticks. But more on this later. Amongst all of this chaos, something fell behind. Movies. In this market, TV shows took center stage. They were cheap to make and more efficient when it came to retaining subscribers. Releasing films straight to streaming or with an initial limited theater run wasn't financially viable and hard to measure their success. Each service had its fair share of self-produced films, but compared to TV series, they probably get 5% of the attention. What sucks even more is that streaming is one of the reasons that theaters are dying. This decline of theaters is severely limiting the kinds of movies that are worth making, with mid-budget films almost going extinct. And when streaming services start shifting their focus from market share to profits, films will most likely be the first thing to get dropped. But there is one thing that streaming wars brought back, 
Piracy. It was never really gone, but Netflix in the mid 2010s was able to suppress it a little with how convenient its service was. But the splitting of catalogs and pumping out of new original content ushered in the golden age of piracy. The cherry on top was that movies became available on streaming services much sooner after their theater release, making them available on the salty seas months earlier than usual. Sometimes they even coincided with their theater run, as was the case with the Warner Bros. HBO Max deal. 2022 was the turning point of the streaming wars where we finally saw an end in sight, but it wasn't the kind of ending we were hoping for. The first three quarters of 2022 had everyone but Netflix reporting losses, but even Netflix reported a drop in subscribers for the first time in over a decade. Each streaming service entered this market knowing that it would have to suffer financially for a few years so they could earn money in the long run. But the uncertainty of the market is making it difficult to put up with losses, with the uncertainty stemming from the complexity of the streaming service business model. The success of linear TV was easy to measure using Nielsen ratings that looked at raw viewership numbers as the only metrics of importance that advertisers paid for. If lots of people are watching a show, then the network gets paid more and it's considered a success. But how do you judge whether a show on Netflix is successful? This is where streaming content becomes worse. Since these services are subscription-based, their focus is on getting new subscribers and subscriber retention. In an ideal world, this can be achieved by consistently creating great and original content, but this is also expensive. High budget shows also depreciate in value quickly with these subscription-based metrics. Netflix's solution to this is that new shows bring in new users. In the current competitive market, the analysts at Netflix definitely crunch the numbers to find that making a lot of cheaper shows with no hesitation to ax them is the way to go. This strategy has been getting some backlash this past year to the point where we're unsure about watching any of their new shows until they confirm a second season, like the 1899 cancellation that hurt us over here at Filmstack. A show only becomes more expensive each new season, with lucrative contracts needed to secure them. It becomes much more appealing for Netflix to spend money on new shows instead that have an easier shot at gaining new subscribers. And their strategy going forward seems to be quantity over quality, as terrible content is cheap to make. Have a few hit shows and fill up the rest with bargain bin content that many will eat up as guilty pleasures when they see it on the front page. It also helps that Netflix doesn't have reviews anymore, or the percentage of likes. Now, it's just a percentage match for you. And with some of their top shelf shows preparing for their final seasons, Netflix is sweating more than ever to find new ways to bring in and retain users. Although I'm not sure adding gaming features is the right play here. On the other side of the war, we have Disney Plus, who might have played it too safe with their strategy. Rather than seeing what sticks, Disney knew they had lots of potential with their existing IPs such as Marvel, Star Wars, Disney Animations, and even their old Disney Channel shows. They had certain groups of users in mind with their content and had a great approach to subscriber retention by releasing a few shows for each IP every year. And this was successful for the first few years, but is now having a predictable result, IP burnout. The MCU was already under a lot of scrutiny these past few years with everyone getting Marvel fatigue, and the shows were the catalyst for this. With Phase 5 off to a rocky start, Disney's quote-unquote new CEO addressed these issues recently, announcing they will release less of these shows. But I'm personally starting to feel this fatigue even with Star Wars. And then there was the HBO Max merger with Discovery Plus that had a huge shakeup in its content strategy, which reflects the industry's shift to profits. The merger removed many HBO originals off of its platform, shelved films and post-productions like the Batgirl movie with Brendan Fraser, and scrapped completed seasons of shows. Any show, even returning hits, will be under a lot of pressure to meet expectations, otherwise they too will be axed. This was the year that we, the consumer, realized the future of streaming will be much different. It will have have a smaller, lesser quality library with frequent show cancellations and oh, it will cost a lot more. We've been used to price hikes in the past with Netflix keeping us on our toes every couple of years, but now every service will take part of them as we saw in 2022. Although only a couple of dollars increase for each one, it begins to add up when you subscribe to a few of them. But this is something we knew was coming and will continue to get worse as these streaming platforms aren't financially viable. Having a few is still much cheaper than cable, but we can expect these services to really bump up their prices in a few years as the current prices aren't sustainable. It's something we didn't wanna hear but the only way for these platforms to survive is for us, the consumer, to lose. Lately, we've also been seeing plans with ads pop up. This is a good option moving forward, but it negates one of the biggest benefits of using streaming services over cable. And expect these ad plans to get much worse with time. 
If there's no price increase, then there will be an increase in the number of ads. We've seen this with YouTube who are injecting ads anywhere they can, or even worse with Twitch, where I started getting greeted with eight ads queued up before a stream. And then there's the infamous Netflix password sharing restrictions. Maybe the reason why we came up with this topic as we're in Canada who just got hit by it. An anti-consumer indirect price increase. It didn't matter if you were paying for a set number of streams at once, now they need to be at your location. This is the ultimate profit over market share move that their number crunch found would be the right decision despite the negative press on top of the price hikes and content cancellations. At the end of 2022, Bob Iger came back to be Disney CEO once again to shake things up. In a recent earnings call, he said, the streaming business is not delivering the kind of profitability or bottom line results that the linear business delivered. He then went on to contradict the industry's ideology that hoarding all of your content exclusively on your platform was the best strategy. This was what caused all the streaming services to pop up in the first place. And Bob Iger is now seeing that this wasn't the right move financially. There's been rumors of Disney exploring possibilities of licensing out their original content again, as well as rumors of HBO Discovery Plus licensing out their pulled off titles to ad supported providers. All of a sudden, Sony looks like a possible winner in the streaming wars without even throwing their hat in the ring. By not making their own platform, Sony strictly deals with licensing out their content. It's a safe strategy by not having to double down and suffer severe losses for a few years to get their own platform operational. They continue doing what every studio used to do, except now it was better for them. As the CEO of Sony Pictures Motion Picture Group, Tom Rothman puts it, none of them can deal with each other, but all of them can deal with us. It's certainly been a zigging where everyone zags strategy. It's proved very lucrative for us. But what does this mean for us, the consumer? Streaming, although suffering losses right now, is not going anywhere. It's the future, whereas linear TV is nearing its end. But we'll be seeing some major changes as other platforms start to incorporate Iger's ideas of licensing content. We'll never return to the time of Netflix having everything, but we'll start to see some crossover of material. And although we are the losers of the streaming wars, some platforms will also lose and either become absorbed by another or switch back to Sony's licensing strategy. We predict that eventually things will stabilize with five or so big platforms, each much more expensive than they are now. The headaches of having to know what content is on which service will begin to fade away, but at the cost of prices matching cable TV packages. So what can you do to reduce your loss in the streaming wars? One option would be to explore the ad supported plans once these services start to pass your budget or give free streaming platforms a try like Crackle, Roku, Crunchyroll, or YouTube where you have awesome channels like Filmstack to binge. But the best option, and it's a problem streaming services are trying to tackle, is rotating subscriptions. Most people People don't need to have access to every service for all 12 months of the year. What you can do instead is wait until you have a decent backlog of things to watch on one platform and then subscribe to it to catch up. While catching up on this backlog, your backlogs on other services will grow and you can rotate to another afterwards. Streaming services try to combat this by making yearly subscriptions a better deal and spreading their content throughout the year, but if you can withstand the hype of new releases, then this is the best legal option. We want to hear from you though. What are your thoughts on the streaming wars and which services do you plan on subscribing to in the long run? If you have any thoughts on the future of streaming, make sure to leave a comment down below. We have lots of exciting videos on the way, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. And until next time, have a good one.